Good morning and welcome to worship here at Willow United Methodist Church. It's a nippy morning. Negative seven was what we read, but inside our hearts are warm and we are thankful for the gift of this day and we are thankful for the gift of you and thankful that you are worshiping with us this morning. My name is Christina Dowling Soka and I along with my spouse Joe D. Dowling Soka have the great privilege of being the pastors here at Willow United Methodist Church in Willow, Alaska. And on behalf of the whole congregation, we welcome you. Our service on this fourth Sunday after Epiphany is a very special one. We will be looking at the first event, the first thing that Jesus did in the Gospel of Mark after he called the disciples. And I think that you'll find it a very interesting story. Our thanks go to those who are participating in the service this morning, to Mary Lemmings, our wonderful pianist, and to Jeff Bertrand and Julie Mitchell for reading. We think you'll find it helpful if you download the bulletin, and we invite you to participate in the readings and the songs. Welcome. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. zones to go where grace is needed most. The word of the Lord will come, gathering all the outsiders and insiders into one community of the kingdom. Our hymn of praise is Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above, number 126 in the hymnal. Sing with us. <laughs>
you join us in the community prayer as printed in your bulletin? Loving God, whose touch can heal the broken places of life. Touch us today. God of peace, whose spirit of peace can quiet our spirits of confusion and despair. Reassure us today. Forgiving God, whose call to repentance promises grace upon grace. Place your mercy in our souls today. You who heal the sick and liberate the imprisoned, who bring justice in the midst of oppression and strength in the midst of weakness. Pour out your spirit of power upon us today. Open our hearts to new faithfulness. Redirect our waywardness. Hold us gently in your goodness. We confess our need to you. And we turn to you with hearts filled with hope, remembering the promises you have made to us. May your name be glorified in us and through us. We ask it through Christ Jesus, your only begotten Son, the one who is our Lord and our Savior, our sibling and our friend. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from the 111th chapter of Psalms. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds the Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Sing with us, my life flows on, how can I keep from sin? Let's sing together. Thank you. 
for our children's message and I'd like to invite you children to come on close up to the screen where you can see what I have to show you today. I wanted to show you two things. I wanted to show you first of all a, a clock that comes from the wall in the sanctuary where I am standing. I love clocks. I have a watch on today that a friend of mine gave me in Tennessee. It's got a cute cat and it's got a little hand that goes around and each time that hand goes around, it's another minute. Did you know there are 60 minutes in an hour and there are 24 hours in a day? And somebody figured out that there are 525,600 minutes in a year. And I was thinking what a gift each of those minutes are. Each minute is a minute where we can share Jesus' love. Jesus was all about sharing love. In our gospel lesson, in a little bit, we're going to hear about one way Jesus shared love when he was in his synagogue, which is like his church, one morning in the town of Capernaum. Can you say the word synagogue? That's a big word. Well, I was looking at my Jesus storybook Bible, and I was noticing how many minutes Jesus filled with love. Thankful to Zonder Kids for allowing us to share these pictures today, but there Jesus is with an older lady, and he's helping her. He was busy. He was on his way to someplace important, but she stopped him and touched the hem of his garment, and he helped her. Or there he is. Here's a wonderful story where He's helping a little child who needed his help. Let's see what else we can find. Oh, yes. Here's the day that Jesus fed 5,000 people. That's a lot of people. And that little child that we show, they, they shared their love. There's the people being fed. They shared their five little loaves and two little fishes. Or one day, the disciples thought that Jesus was too busy to welcome the children, but he said, no, let them come. And he used the moments that day to play with the children and to welcome them in. Every moment that Jesus had, he filled with love. Oh, here's a picture of him loving a little man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tiny little man, and he couldn't see Jesus, and not many people like Zacchaeus, but Jesus was his friend. And there's a picture of Jesus and Zacchaeus. So many people to love. And he let people be his friend who didn't have many friends. Here's the woman washing his feet. And then Jesus washed his disciples' feet. I love the Bible. And I love my Bible storybook because it tells how Jesus filled each minute of each day with God's love. And you know what? I pray that you and I, that we will find lots of ways to share Jesus' love this week. I want to teach you a song. It goes like this. Jesus, I want to be like you. Jesus, I want to be like you. Jesus, I want to be like you. I want to be like you. Sing it with me. Jesus, I want to be like you. Jesus, I want to be like you. Jesus, I want to be like you. I want to be like you. Now we're going to do love. Jesus, I want to love like you. Jesus, I want to love like you. Jesus, I want to love like you. I want to love like you. 
Thanks for coming up. Our lesson is from Mark, the first chapter, beginning with the 14th verse. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fisher for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in this synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, I give you thanks for each one who is worshiping with us this day. Open our hearts and our ears, our minds, to your message, your message of love, your message of challenge, your message of grace. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. My goodness, how quickly this year is going by. I can't believe it is already the end of January, and we are well on our way in this epiphany journey as we seek to reflect the light and the love of Christ. There's a song that's been running through my mind this week. You may remember it's a song from the musical Rent. And I discovered that that musical uh, is 25 years old uh, last week. It's a story, a modern day retelling of La Boeing, the opera. It's a story of a group of friends navigating their way through relationships and life in the midst of the AIDS crisis and the setting is in New York City. It's a story, as I said, based on the opera Lo Boheme. And at one point, they sing this marvelous song, 525,600 minutes, 525,000 moments so dear. Maybe you remember it. 525,600 minutes, 525,000 moments so dear, 525,600 minutes, how do you measure, measure a year? And the verse goes, in daylight, in sunset, in midnight, in cups of coffee, in inches, in miles, in laughter, and smile. And then the second verse goes on to say, how do you measure a life? And the answer is, how about love? How about love? We measure life. We measure a year in love. There are those moments in our life which rise above the other moments. The ancient Greeks used to call it the difference between chronos, time going by moment by moment by moment so fast. Seems it's getting a lot faster the older I get. And then there are these kairos moments, these moments of significance, these moments, these holy moments. They can be ordinary moments, but they rise above the others because they are moments of love. Well, the play I mentioned, it ended up receiving many prizes, a Pulitzer, and many other awards. But sadly, the composer of that song, and indeed the com 
the playwright, the composer of all the songs, Jonathan Larson, never got to see the musical completed. He died unexpectedly of heart-related matters. And they were about to uh, redo, completely redo, when they heard this word. It was the night before the opening. And the stage folk, they decided, well, the parents wanted them to go on with the show, and, but they were going to do it differently. They were going to sit in their places on that stage and sing the chorus, including this song, 525,600 Minutes. But by the time they got to the end of the first act, they couldn't contain it anymore. They got up and they did the staging, they did the dancing as Jonathan had uh, envisioned it, a grand tribute to this life and this message of hope and love and that love and relationships are what matters most. How quickly the moments seem to go by in these days. Jesus' ministry was three short years, and yet it was chock full of love. It was chock full of those kairos moments that I was speaking of, those moments which rise above all others. It's interesting. I can imagine what it was like for those first gospel writers. How do you measure a life, a life like the life of Jesus? What do you uplift? What stories do you tell? And they each approached it differently. It's fun to see what their first messages were about. In John, it is that great moment when Jesus turns the water into wine and there's abundance. John is all about abundance, knowing abundant life and knowing the life that was the light of the world. And then in Matthew, Matthew loves this image of Jesus, the teacher, and you see the first scenes after the calling is up on the mountain. And Jesus is teaching the sermon on the mount, these beautiful words, the Beatitudes, these words of be salt, be light, of love your enemy. Jesus is the teacher in those first moments. And then in the book of Luke, you see him preaching in the synagogue in his hometown, Nazareth. And he tells the truth in such a way that at first they receive him gladly, but then he makes the hometown crowd so angry they're about to throw him off of the cliff. But he preaches words like the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, deliverance, good news to the poor, words of beauty and words of truth that also anger the hometown crowd. But I love this story from Mark, this story that Julie read a few moments ago. This is the opening scene in this Gospel of Mark, the scene where Jesus has gone into the synagogue. It says that he preaches with authority and not as one of the scribes. And I could just imagine, have you ever been in a place where someone has been preaching or speaking and suddenly your heart feels strangely warm and you get a sense that you are sitting in the presence of the holy, almost that you could take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground and sometimes you get this warm feeling in your soul. And I imagine that as they heard Jesus speak, they realized that he was authentic, that he was the real thing. And I could just imagine them leaning forward with expectancy. He was speaking from his heart. He was speaking truth. <laughs> he was speaking about the kingdom, the kingdom of God in their midst, because you see, that is what the gospel of Mark is all about, proclaiming the good news of God and that the kingdom is at hand. In this moment, in each and every moment, we have the opportunity to open our hearts and our lives to the good news of God's kingdom. I don't know how I would have felt if I had been a part of Jesus' family. If I was mama, his mama, I would have been so scared. Because you see, his message was the same message. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's the same message that had gotten John arrested just a few 
verses before. And here he is preaching this message. Here he is going into the synagogue to preach this message, the same message that got John into so much trouble and that would eventually lead Jesus to the cross, to laying down his life in love for us. I haven't had to give up much for my faith. I know that there are many places where persons are persecuted for their faith, whatever that faith may be. And Christians are certainly among those who are persecuted for their faith. I have only, jokingly I say, I've only been arrested about four times. And three of those had to do with uh, the uh, sticker on my back uh, uh, license plate not being changed. I always used to blame Joe D for that being pulled over one night right in front of Cherokee United Methodist Church where they were having their potluck supper and I was pulled over and all the men were out there looking at me being pulled over and they kept going on inside to Jody to tell him Christine has been pulled. <laughs> he didn't come out. <laughs> but, uh, oh, and then there was a time where I didn't have my uh, light. My front light was out and Officer uh, O'Brien just said, I'm just trying to keep you safe, man. But the first time, I was arrested <laughs> was when I was in the third grade. When I was little, I couldn't whistle. I tried and tried and tried to whistle. I'd be going as puckered as much as I could. I would work on it for hours. Well, it was in the third grade when we were on a bathroom break and I was in the little stall and finally, my little mouth figured it out, and I was able to whistle. <laughs> and it was the loudest whistle, and I got reported by the bathroom monitor. <laughs> I've never been arrested for my faith. As I was thinking about playfully saying uh, that I've been arrested when I was in the third grade, that little image of whistling came to mind. Daddy wrote a book of poetry. It was called Whistling in the Light. And of course, it's a, a play on the word uh, whistling in the dark, where uh, you're going around with bravado and you're being braver than you can. Well, he changed this around to be whistling in the light because we as Christians have this sure and certain hope that Christ's light is going to shine and that God's authority is sure, and that no matter what, we can trust that God's grace has the final say and can be the final authority in our lives. He wrote this book. He wrote it, uh, gathered some poems uh, that Mama had helped him gather, and in those long, long years when she was uh, uh, struggling with so valiantly through the disease of Alzheimer's, uh, we found time to put that poetry together and self-published a book. Well, I love what he wrote at the beginning of the book. He wrote a story that he quoted from Ted Evans in a book entitled Life is Like That. Ted was a young seminary student and he was doing a student pastorate in a town and Mr. Gentry was a member of the community where Tex served as a student pastor. And Tex noticed that whenever he went by their house, Mr. Gentry was always whistling as he worked in the back garden. And he had this beautiful garden, all oh, these beautiful flowers, deep colors, so many flowers and green vegetables. And one day he asked someone in the congregation why it was that Mr. Gentry was always whistling so loudly. And uh, the friend said, well, why don't you stop by Mr. Gentry's and ask him to tell you himself? So a few days later, Tex uh, came by this house and he introduced himself to the retired gardener. And during the conversation, Tex looked up at the porch and he discovered his answer. There was a woman sitting placidly on the porch in a wheelchair. And he asked Mr. Gentry why it was he whistled so loudly when he was working in the garden. And this beautiful story unfolded. Text learned that the elderly woman was wheelchair bound and blind. 
and Mr. Gentry whistled for the benefit of his wife. He wanted her to know that she wasn't alone. He wanted her to know that he was mindful of her and that he wouldn't leave her, that he was available and would go to her the moment that she called. He goes on to say about God, he says, God knows about us and he's concerned for us and he won't leave us. God gives us signs and songs in the night in the midst of our own darkness to assure us that he is present. The people that Mark was writing to, the people in fact that all the gospel writers were writing to, knew what it was to journey through the long dark night of the soul. They had seen their holy places crumble. They had seen their friends arrested for the faith. They had been expecting Jesus to come out back at a certain moment and a certain time and yet it was taking longer than they thought and they didn't know what to hope. They had uh, times where they couldn't find their way, where they lost their way, where they experienced true darkness. And yet, in the midst of this darkness, moment after moment of love and light and stories break through as the gospel writers shared these beautiful images of who Jesus is. I love this story of Jesus in the Sabbath, in Capernaum, and the healing of this man who is controlled by demons. I love it for many reasons. I love it that Jesus is always crossing boundaries. He's always going to the ones who need him the most, who are the most hurting, the most ostracized, the most alone. He's there preaching in the temple, and yet he has time on the Sabbath to break the laws and to heal this man who cries out, in recognition of who Jesus is. You see, Jesus came for the ones who were imprisoned. And they say that uh, the, the man cries out, Holy One of God, what have you to do with us? And I love that about the story too, because as you think about it, what does God have to do with that man? What does God have to do with us? I got to thinking, God has everything to do with us. You see, we each are possessed by many things. Oh, maybe we don't term it in terms of demon possession, and yet we are imprisoned. Sometimes we get imprisoned by our fears, by our worries, by our anxiety. Sometimes we lose our way and we get imprisoned by by uh, broken relationships, hatred, by the forces that are bigger than us. We get carried away with the crowd. We fail to take bold stands for our faith. Sometimes we fill up the emptiness with things that aren't healthy for us. We become addicted. We get addicted to our, our phones or we get addicted to substances. Sometimes we are imprisoned. And yet Christ comes into our imprisoned moments and wants to share the truth with us and set us free. What have you to do with us? And the answer from the Christ is I have everything to do with you because you are my beloved child and I want to heal you. I want to set you free. Jesus, you see, is in the business of reclaiming lives. He doesn't come for the people who have it all together. He comes for the broken people, the hurting people. And he's in the business of setting us free so that we can let God's kingdom be manifest in our everyday lives. There's a lot to be afraid of in this big hurting world. And there's so many times that we can shift our eyes from what matters most. And we can forget that we have a God who is greater than the one who is in this world. And that we have a God who is there every step of the way. And that we have a God on whose foundation we can trust will be that he will be our solid rock. Even when the earth shakes, God can be our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. The good news is that we have someone 
who is greater than all the things we may face. John Ortberg shares a story about when he was a young college student. He had some friends who were working down near the beach one night. A fight broke out in a nearby bar and spilled out into the street right in front of them. It was a classic fight, two guys beating up another, and Ortberg and his friends felt compelled to go in, and they marched into there, and they simply said, cut it out. Well, all of a sudden, to their amazements, the two guys stopped beating up on the other. They looked their way. Their eyes got big, and they immediately started running the other way. Well, Ortberg and his friends thought they must have done something really powerful until they turned around. And there was this huge, hulking bouncer behind them, a giant of a person, and they call that person Mungo. And Ortberg said, I got to thinking afterward, if I walked around with someone like Mongo walking behind me all the time, someone with that size and strength, I would face life a lot differently than I do. I would have a lot more courage. And of course, the good news is that we do have someone who has our backs, but who also goes before us and is on either side of us. Someone whose authority is greater than any authority in this world. Someone who is greater than all of this. And you don't have to look far in our world to see the forces of destruction in our lives. You don't have to look far to see all the brokenness, all the things that can entrap us, all the forces that work against human dignity, the care of creation and sacred worth. But what is most important is in the midst of it all. The first moment that Mark records is this moment when he sets this person free and a brilliant song of freedom that it is. I wonder this morning, what are the places of brokenness or disappointment or fear in your life? What I love about our story is that Jesus comes near in those moments and he takes us. What if we placed our brokenness in his hands this day? And what if we place the brokenness that we see around us in friends and familyhood and neighborhoods in our systems? Could God be wanting to work through ordinary people like you and me in ordinary simple moments of love? We have so many moments each year, 525,600 minutes in which we can let God's light and God's kingdom shine through us. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? And he says, everything. I have everything to do with you, my child. I came to set you free. I came to give you my light that you might know. My abundance, my freedom, my truth that you may be made whole. Jesus was all about the truth, all about setting us free. And my prayer for you this day is that you will know the abundant life that Jesus comes to bring, that you will, in each story that you read about him, see his teaching lived out, and that you will accept his grace and say, Lord, take me and use me. I'm broken, but I want to place myself in your hands. I want to have you transform and make me whole. The one who comes to announce the reign of the kingdom of God, this one we know in Jesus he helps us. It's so much more than a whistle in a night. It's a full-throated song of praise. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow unafraid. And whatever we are facing, we can say, it is well with my soul. Let us pray. Gracious God, Rescue us from the forces of evil and destruction that pervade our lives and our culture and use us as instruments of your blessing, your healing, and your peace. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Our hymn of response is, It is well with my soul. Let's sing. extraordinary world and its reminders of resilience, grace, hope, and life. For when grass shoots break through concrete, when the sun emerges after storms, for when people offer laughter in deep sadness, in these moments we see glimpses of who you are, and we are grateful. Yet, if we reduce you to being like the cycle of nature or the best of humankind, we diminish your power to make the impossible real, to break apart the in, impenetrable evils of oppression, to cast out the very real fears that paralyze us, to banish the insidious demons of judgment, and worthlessness. Forgive us, God, when we do not trust you to deal with the unspeakable awfulness in our lives and world. In the silence, we name the parts of our lives and our world that we believe are too broken to ever be made whole. Cast out our demons, Lord. This is a day of new beginnings. Make us new again. Forgive us when we contribute to the brokenness of the world, 
in the lives of people around us. In the silence, we name the things we have done that separate us from you and from others. Cast out our demons, Lord. This is a day of new beginnings. Make us new again. Forgive us when we trust darkness more than we trust your light. In the silence, we name the things we think we need to keep hidden. Cast out our demons, Lord. This, this is, is a, a day, day of new beginnings. beginnings. Make, Make us new again. again. Scripture says that those who are in Christ are a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, the new has come. Hear then Christ's word of grace to us. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of affirmation is, This is a Day of New Beginning. Show. Sure. 
And so our time of worship has come to an end this morning. And yet our week of worship is just beginning. In a year, 525,600 minutes, so many minutes, to open our hearts to the love of God and to share that love with others. We pray that you have been blessed this morning, and we pray that you will go forth knowing yourself as a beloved child of God. And as we say every week, we pray that you will be generous, generous to yourself, generous to your neighbor as Christ defines neighbor, generous to your community <clears throat> and to your world. We want to say a word of thanks to all of you who have been so generous with Willow United Methodist Church and with the Willow Community Food Pantry. I'm standing here in front of the weekend food bag operation. We have volunteers who come in every other week and they pack up bags that are given each week through the school, about over 40 bags that have uh, weekend food couple of breakfast items, a couple of lunch items, usually between 11 and 14 items total. And it's our way of fighting hunger insecurity in the lives of the bags that these children go to. We also give out many in our drive-through each Wednesday. We're in the fellowship hall of the church, and we've kind of overflowed into the fellowship hall during this time of pandemic because it takes a lot more space to be able to serve the community because we're doing the food pantry as an outdoor drive through So we're thankful for the church for allowing us to use this space. For those of you who would like to support the ministries here in Alaska, our mailing address is P.O. Box 182, Willow, Alaska 99688. And you can support the church or the food pantry by making a check out to Willow United Methodist Church and then putting on the byline, whether it is for the church or the food pantry. We are thankful for our many, many supporters who make the work here in Alaska possible. Thank you for joining with us in worship this morning. Know that we appreciate you and we pray that as you go from this virtual space, that the blessings of the living Lord will be with you. 525,600 minutes. May we fill them with Christ's love. Mm -hmm.